Now it's my pleasure to ask Abdul Malik Simon to join me here on stage. Where is he? Oh, yeah. yeah, Abdul Malik um, Simon um, is now coming. Do you want to join me? Or thank you. Well, either way. <laughs> okay. Um, he's uh, currently a research professor at the Max Planck Institute uh, for the study of religious and ethnic diversity, a visiting professor also at Goldsmith College and um, also in Cape Town at the university. So many, many academic positions all over the world. Um, we've also been very lucky to um, have a text by Abdul Malik in, in our book here uh, on case studies, global case studies, um, which basically forms the basis um, of tonight's lecture to an extent, um, which is also situated more in the global south, maybe also hinting to a kind of counter uh, position to a certain belief on state infrastructures, uh, which was something that in yesterday's discussion there was always a, a kind of souvenir of something larger that could help uh, within the housing crisis. Uh, yeah, uh, I think we can discuss more of that. And uh, yeah, give please give a very warm welcome to Abdul Malik. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, by generic, um, first of all, it's deep into the ni Saturday night, and um, I, I'm, I'm sure people are anxious to make the opening party of Ber Berlin's renowned porn film festival, so I just have a few, few notes. Um, so, by generic, I, I consider a way into a process of urbanizing that endures despite the vast structural rearrangements underway for some time. A dimension of the urban that lies in the interstices between above and below, mobility and confinement, circulation and stasis, city and region, core and periphery. And although not specific to cities like Jakarta or Lagos or Mexico City or Manila, or Sao Paulo or Karachi, for example, renewed attention to still vast underexplored spaces of the majority of the inhabitants of these cities, neither poor nor rich nor strictly middle class, offers a lens on this endurance. The urban as this conditions of things and bodies being with each other, where a multiplicity of ways of where a multiplicity of ways in which withness takes place raises questions about who inhabits the city. We know that there are individuals and there's households and families and institutions and material assemblages and buildings and on and on. But are these either the proper entities or designations for thinking about the realities of inhabitation, of who inhabits? For being with does not readily assume that we know exactly what or who is with whom. It cannot definitively assume that the city is for us or that its forces care for us in any way. I, I take this notion of the generic partly from the work of Francois Laurel, where the genetic refers both to the condition of being anything whatsoever and being nothing beyond what one is. And as such, no matter how the details of city experience and its components might be explained, these explanations always remain insufficient to what these details might be and how they might act. It doesn't mean that, that anything we might identify as an entity, an actor, has a capacity or being on its own separate from other things, or that it is impermeable to being affected and connected into all kinds of arrangements and structuring. Rather, what Laurel is suggesting is that we might view infrastructural arrangements, which are usually seen as combining and reticulating and representing and enjoining, as also a process of detaching. 
And instead of seeing such detachment as necessarily exclusion or segregation, we might also see it as the grounds for viewing urban spaces in new ways, of keeping things out of analytic connections, and to think of the potentials of the supposedly useless, marginal, or anachronistic in different ways. And this sense of detachment may be particularly important now as urban governance is increasingly obsessed with the relationship among things, with devising forms of data retrieval and calculation, parametric designs and algorithmic operations that attempt to measure the relationships between different aspects of the city. What does the volume of material flows, the fluctuation of municipal bond rates, the circulation of traffic, the rates of subsidence, electricity generation, rates of infrastructural degeneration, or the financial value of housing stock, what do all these things have to do with each other? What is their quantitative impact on each other? And the irony here is that mathematically we may be indeed able to quantify such mutual impacts but the story of these relationships are likely to be rendered in a language that no one will understand, a language that impacts upon the real city, but which is something else besides it, even as it is part of it. Now, in, in some sense, the dilemmas, the struggles, the figurings about this notion of being with, of withness, were once concretized in the built environment and in the relationships of collective and individual effort, experimentation in various fabrics of belonging, solidarity, sometimes citizenship, sometimes people fighting to emerge or survive. But as Andrew just said, in, in, in some way, now urban inhabitants and users are not coherent entities, but shifting fields of probable actions data sets, risk calculations, credit ratings, and on and on. Populations are less defined by stable attributes through which relative inequities can be measured than by the nature of their convertibility and their interoperability. The, cap ca ca the capacity of any population to compose and decompose to become different things at different times. And as such, residents of cities are unfolded into variegated spatializations of scrutiny consumption, maneuver, and regulation that are brought forth through various forms of social mediation, branding, tracking systems, and networks. So when we talk then about inhabitants and the rights appropriate to inhabitants, there's a large amount of ambiguity as to who exactly we're talking about and who feels affected and what kinds of senses are at work to perceive what is equitable and, and what is not. But yet, in some sense, the, despite this, there is something about this witness that still spills over these kinds of calculations. Take a neighborhood. Imagine all the actions, events, gestures, exertions, speech, and operations that take place at any given time. No one situated in this neighborhood or outside of it can possibly be aware of all of these occurrences. What they can be aware of, as well as the kind of impacts they register among them, the impact each has upon each other is largely a matter of the infrastructure available to them. For this infrastructure provides specific ways of witnessing or sensing what the intersecting trajectories of force bring about. So infrastructure establishes specific channels of interaction among these occurrences, specific trajectories of impact. As a result, we come to know, feel, and be is largely a matter of in infrastructure. But force always can exceed the bounds placed on it. It leaks, it radiates, and affects in ways that cannot always be anticipated and controlled. Thus, any of these occurrences can ramify across each other, affecting and being affected in ways that exceed whatever infrastructure is available. Volatility is the default position. And in this sense, infrastructure is always then built on turbulence. And this turbulence may largely be constrained, but it doesn't go away. It's always there. And the totality of these interaffected occurrences is in some sense then the generic. And in some sense then, this notion of, wit of, 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 of witness, of, of being with, is always in some sense full of mistakes and full of potentials at the same time. When I step out of my house 
on a small lane in a very heterogeneous district in Jakarta and turn the corner onto a busy street. I step into the midst of seemingly interminable arguments between two storekeepers over whose responsibility it is to make sure that the trash container doesn't overflow, or two young men who voluntarily sweep the streets for several hours every morning in order to strike up quick conversations with people waiting for transportation to go to work, the beginning and ends of furtive couplings in the cheap by the hour hotels, I step into the same convocation of customers at the small eating places where they compare notes and plot both sensible and outrageous conspiracies to elevate their incomes. I step into the lining of devotees in front of the shabby office of a major local politician who moonlights as a spiritual advisor. I step into the constant loading and unloading of trucks that in the frenzy always deliver goods to the wrong destinations. I step into the constant milling about of people of all ages, seeming to wait for real responsibilities, but nevertheless feed the street with eyes and rumors. I step into the daily appearance of some new construction or alteration, of something going wrong and being left unfixed for only seconds or decades. I step into the battered or bored lives, going about pursuing the same routines and routes as well as those who approach this street where they have spent every day of their lives as if it was the first time. These multiple encounters, this, witness, this witness, this separated enactments, neither good nor bad, are the witness, the being with, the inhabiting of this popular district. They are its real politics, even as hierarchies of authority and institutions are, are, are also obviously in place. Varying distributions of capacities to affect and be affected, to bring things into relationship, to navigate actual potential relations, these are all political matters. They are its resourcefulness and vulnerability, things that are always on the verge of slipping away. So even though arguably the, 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 the greatest work in, in urban theory is being done by by Brenner and Schmidt now, who attempt to understand how specific urban domains are constituted through a palimpsest of processes and their increasingly planetary articulations. There's a sense of instability that doesn't go beyond the details. In other words, the specificities of materials, actors, and technicities are not constellated into patterns or evidence of macrostructural maneuvers. They are their own things and constitute their own alliances. While urban domains are certainly the products of particular structures operating across different registers of life, generic instability refers to the ways in which the apparent systematicity of cities is in large part a process of one thing simply leading to another. Things come and go, shifting the work they do in a seemingly endless process of readjustment and recalibration. There are many rhythmic modulations and materials of the relationships between power, policy, and popular practices. But again, what is it? What are they today? What's happening again today? So under these circumstances, under these circumstances where in some sense everything possibly slips slips away, what does one what does one do? So in some sense everyone looks to where people gather or wait or enter or exit where there is a moment of hesitation and everyone thinks about what you can put in front of them, what they could see and experience, and then buy or talk about to someone else. Everyone steps outside of their front door and looks at the different angles, the different lines of sight. They see how one thing leads to another and how the different ways where they are standing are connected to a larger surround and how the distance between them and all of that could be gathered up by something they could do with others that they already know, some kind of coordinated operation. Because if you look inside of people's houses, you realize just how much stuff has been locally sourced by these operations, how many things have been fixed and invented. Some of these projects are about operating across various gaps and enclosures. Canals, intersections, administrative boundaries have to be crossed. Empty lots and vacant spaces can be filled in for the time being. And while collaborative effort amongst residents may seem like putting together individuals in some mathematical-like set, it is usually more an intermeshing of projects. And the intermeshing is a generic. 
So while norms and policy and law may guide the melding and coordinating of individuals and corporate entities, they may have little traction with projects that are imagined and enacted with shifting casts of characters, terrains, objectives, and results. So imagine then at the same time where all of the devices you could possibly use to tell you where you are and what you can reasonably expect from being located where you are simply lie to you. Imagine the situation where the built environment of your surroundings is so depleted, so lacking in diverse points of reference and anchorage that all you experience is the seemingly aimless mobility of bodies who may look like you but where you have few precise ideas about where they came from. Imagine a situation where there is really no reason for you to go much anywhere, or where the places to go, such as jobs and schools and clinics and other public facilities, are either so removed from the realities you live, or which are so geographically far away, or which are not willing to accommodate or service you anyway. Imagine a situation where no matter where you go, even when your location devices are turned off, that people who intend to do you harm can still triangulate your location anyway. Imagine tit-for-tat retaliations for offenses no one is even aware of having committed or of being apprehended by the police for being part of something that is a figment of their imagination or which those same police had basically dismantled a long time ago. What is it in such a world then that a person should pay attention to? How does a person navigate any kind of trajectory that provides a storyline and sense of where that story is going? So oftentimes, young people in, uh, in Karachi and Jakarta and Lagos always seem to be on the run, always seem to be trying to be close to the action, but never knowing exactly where that action is going to be, because you, that, the, where the, the place of that action is all, always changing. And in this sense, then, in, in this sense of not being anchored, not being located, boarding houses, the notion of the boarding house returns as a kind of prominent, prominent notion of a, of, 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 a, of, of a house. That is, in some sense, boarding houses constitute a plurality of nodes that are simultaneously articulated and detached. And in a place like Jakarta, it's interesting that in the urban core, I mean, almost half of all residents Turn, turn their houses into boarding houses. So in some ways, the infrastructure of this kind of sense of accommodating youth who are always having the sense of being on the run, there's an infrastructure available for then always being on the run. So detached in that they are not embedded or controlled in specific patterns of trajectories or of, of relations. These plurality of nodes are points platforms through which urban residents can circulate, string together circulations as livelihoods and socialities, opportunities for information exchange, witnessing and recalibration, new forms of mobile collectives, ephemeral, short-term, provisional, are always taking place. Strings of cheap accommodations in eating places and markets and retail outlets that absorb increasingly large volumes of youth labor that change jobs often every, every, three, to, every three to six months. So in some sense, what I'm trying to then in, in, to conclude, having missed it, Is the, objective, the, the, the objective here is, is to posit how it might be possible to move beyond the current orientations of progressive urban politics. These current orientations either emphasize neoliberal misery, green revolution salvation, repeated attempts to mobilize sufficient numbers and design mechanisms to make participatory planning and decision making effective, or the overly pragmatic realism of corporate associations of the urban poor, which concentrate on building a semi-autonomous safety net that is recognized as inadequate in the long run, but capable of making significant improvements in the present. 
These orientations are limited in that they do not constitute the sum total of the political imaginary at the level of urban districts and neighborhoods. And in some way, the progressive urban politics that I think we need to rethink has to return to, again, the sense of the details. The details by which, in some sense, particularly for cities of the South, the details of which the urban majority, the majority of inhabitants of this city, are engaged in day in and day out, a majority that we don't even have names for describing the districts in which they live, a majority that we don't even have social classifications for identifying who they are and what they are. And so in some sense, the, what I'm trying to emphasize by this notion of the generic is to try to return to the details about what it is that they're doing, even under incredibly severe structural constraints, even in an atmosphere where it's very difficult for them to know exactly what is happening to their lives, where to pay attention to, where the power is coming from, what to, what to pay attention to within the multitude of things that they see impacting on their life, who operate under conditions oftentimes of a total, complete disorientation, but yet continue to do things with each other. And what are those kinds of, and what are those kinds of details? And in some sense, the, the notion that the, the proliferation of the boarding house comes once again to dominate much of the housing within these cities says something about the new conditions of being with in cities of the, of such as Jakarta, Lagos, Sao Paulo, Manila, and so forth. And then just to leave you with Fred Moten and Stefano Harney, in the trick of politics, we are insufficient. We are scarce, waiting in the pockets of resistance, in stairwells, in alleys, in vain. The false image and its critique threaten the common with democracy, which is only ever to come, so that one day, which is only never to come, we will be more than what we are. But we already are. We're already here, moving. We've been around. We're more than politics, more than settled, and more than democratic. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Abdul Malik, for, for this presentation, because also I think we probably needed um, also a kind of wake-up call to question some of the things we have discussed in the past few days and also some of the assumptions we had or we took uh, for our <laughs> exhibition. It seems a bit as, as if this is almost a kind of counter position to a uh, certain belief and planning which might be more visible in the northern hemisphere. Um, most of the examples you were showing refer to Jakarta, Lagos and other cities. Um, what do we think about planning? There, there are a number of architects here, maybe they need to have some advice. <laughs> <laughs> This is, this, is, this is always the question that, you know, you, you get, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You present something, you present a sort of different angle, you present a different angle on things, and then the immediate question is, well, then what about, you know, all, it's right. almost as if it's a kind of critique of planning. It's no. almost, a, it's, it's not a critique of planning. I mean, I mean, planning is a, is a, planning is a, is a tool. We've been doing it for God knows how many centuries. Uh, it's not to be abandoned. It's not that residents of, uh, the residents that I'm speaking about don't in their own ways plan or discuss or implicitly collaborate with each other or pay attention to what each other is doing and then try to adjust themselves accordingly. I mean, this is planning as well in a kind of every, everyday basis, so. This is why you insisted on detail. Within, within the generic uh, detached environment. Right. Yeah. I think we, we can directly open up uh, for discussion because I think we, uh, um, we have enough food for thought and discussion here. Um, please, Alan.
great to finally meet you. I've, um, I've, um, I've read a bit of your writing, and I wish I could read some more. And I, um, and I, um, I, I, um, I, I started reading your work before going to Jack. Carter, so I don't know if you described it um, exactly or if I was already anticipating this and found your, um, but um, I'm, it's, it's unfortunate, I think, um, that, you're sp that you're speaking at the end because you've kind of pulled the rug out from underneath a lot of the, like the discourse we've been having over the last uh, two days, but it's, it's really good to pair yours uh, with Andrew Hersher's talk, where he kind of like runs into, um, like the, like this impossible position of not not planning, but of this um, human rights uh, discourse, where he basically ends up um, at the dead end, which Agamben, you know, like uh, um, you know. Um, points out, which is that rights come from, uh, from <laughs> citizenship, they're conferred by sovereignty, um, and, and, this, and, and a power that not only, you know, has control over things, but, it, but has knowledge of things and can see, and, um, and, and, so, um, and so now we're in a situation where the only thing, like, you need to have these rights, or that you get, is you get scanned into, you know, um, into like, the irises scanning um, like system and then you have have some human rights and you and because you've become human or you've become at least like registered and then um, and so then it makes you know this a world where there's these like zones of different categories of, of citizenship and you have like illegal um, you know um, um, Work and not illegal work, and like the you know the full citizens who've got the residency visa and there, and then like um, the people on the artist visa or the like the, um, and so this is this this whole thing where in order to cope with the the either the chaos or the hyper complexity you talk about, there's this attempt to like make everybody a citizen, and then on the other hand, there's this it seems like that you're um, talking about a world where everybody is kind of a refugee and and these things you know like they like all these applications of of um, planning orders and kind of like working schemas um, um, you know they just like kind of they float on top of this like sea and and so I guess if the if the problem in in one mode is um, um, it was like planning and what the right way and the other one is is in 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 your understanding of things how does one act um, not even plan but how do you act how do you do politics how do you do architecture um, knowing that you don't know the conditions and that you don't know the results of your actions how do you keep acting Yeah, no. I mean, it's a, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a very, it's a very salient, salient comment. Um, I, I think. I mean, I, I think there is. I mean, Isabel Stengers has always talked about a notion of of a kind of hesitation, a hesitation that is important to to the process of in, of enacting things. And I mean, for example, in Jakarta. Um, land doesn't belong to anybody, basically. Fundamentally, constitutionally, land doesn't have an owner. It doesn't even belong to the state. Well, I mean, it exists in this kind of constitutional twilight zone. It doesn't mean that land isn't bought and sold. I mean, Jakarta has one of the world's largest real estate markets. It builds like crazy. It displaces like crazy. It sells like crazy. But there's still something about the fundamental hesitation of that ambiguity, where the fundamental ambigu ambiguous status of land still provides a vast operational space for people to enact forms of inhabitation 
that continue to be multiple, continue to be very varied, and continue to form strange contiguities between various different kinds of uses. Now there's a rush, there's a rush. There's a rush from the, from the World Bank, there's a rush from the Asian Development Bank, there's a rush from all of the important multilateral institutions that the only way in which Indonesia is going to be able to afford the provision of affordable housing is by securitizing mortgages, and securitizing mortgages requires then the definitive cadastration of land. That is, you now have to constitutionally create urban land. So they want the government to rush to now define, to get rid of that ambiguity. So in some ways, to act is that there are all kinds of inheritances that cities are, that inherited. Weird, strange colonial inheritances, weird, strange nationalistic ones that never went anywhere, but the laws are still on the books some kinds of arcane kinds of technicities that don't make sense in terms of sort of, but they're there. And in some ways, the rush to eliminate them. So in order to, I think one of the first things in terms of being able to politically is in some sense, the hesitation. The hesitation to remove everything that doesn't make sense, but are almost there as devices and resources that varying inhabitants of an urban region can continue to use to slow things down, to tie things up, to permit a kind of heterogeneity of ways of, 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 of using. So that would be my first response to your question. Hi, uh, I was intrigued that you brought up one specific housing type, the boarding, the boarding house, um, and it seemed like you described it at once as a symptom of how people were living, but it also, I sort of heard out that you don't, you think it's sort of a bad thing, the boarding house. Could you just elaborate a little bit on the boarding house? And this comes from the background of, uh, for instance, my experience in New York, where boarding houses were outlawed in the 1950s. So, so, just no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> no, no. But so just, what's your? Can you talk a little bit more about the boarding house and how you see it as a in in what you've been describing, looking at details, how people actually live. You're talking about slowing down and speeding up. Like, where, where does that type of housing fit in, or home, or whatever you call it? Well, for, I mean, for for for, ex for example, I mean, just like in many many cities of the world, like Me Mexico. I mean, people bought into this. I mean, they gave up their positionality within the urban core. Because in some ways they bought into the kind of phantasm that they could own an asset, they could have a house, and the state availed them various kinds of financing that allowed them to have a kind of small pavilion in the, in the middle of nowhere, in the absolute middle of nowhere. And so kids that grow up, young kids now that are the, the ge generation, they've grown up in the middle of nowhere the parents have realized they've made a mistake, but they're still paying off the, 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 the debt for, some, for, a, for a house that's falling apart. So they're telling their kids, get back into the urban core some, some way. So for example, there are thousands of young women, age 17 to 25, for example, in Jakarta who work in these huge retail markets where the real shopping takes place, not the, not the shopping malls, but the who at 10 o'clock at night, when they leave their, you know, leave their shift, where do, where do they go? They can't go back to their, they're, they're now with the exigency of, of, of repositioning themselves in the urban core. How can they do that? Well, they rent, a, a, they rent a room in a boarding house, no contract needed, nothing to sign, no need to register with the local authorities, they can be invisible, they can live with five, six other young women in a place, divide the room, live for almost nothing. And when it works, it works, but when it's time to move on, they then can, they then can move on. Because unlike before where many youth would like be so grateful to have a kind of job, have any kind of paid job, that they would hang on to it forever, the kind of mode of calculation is changing. 
So the assessment is changing. If this thing don't work for me in three to six months, I'm going to get my ass out of here and I'm going to sort of try to locate myself to a different part of the city, see what's happening there. But what's the infrastructure that will allow me to do that? I can't sign no contract in an apartment. I can't afford it. So the boarding house becomes really a, an infrastructure for this kind of circulation. Besides, for those who are desperately trying to hang on to in the urban core, in face of rapidly escalating property taxes, how do they cover those, ta how do they cover those taxes? Well, they then begin to turn whatever they have, they build an extra floor. I mean, even poor families they will, who have two rooms, eight, eight, eight members, they'll move all eight into one room and rent out the other room to like six other people to... So it also is a means of people being able to, to also ha hang, hang on. So in some sense, the boarding house just becomes a kind of figure of a kind of atmosphere that's taking place of a kind of reorientation, particularly amongst the young, to trying to, in some ways, position themselves proximate to, but in the meantime, in some ways, encountering people that they don't know, that they don't grow up with, that they have no connection with, and trying also to figure out ways of doing something with each other, that also is in a kind of unprecedented, there's no history to it, but they try to figure it out. So the boarding house also becomes a kind of moment of incipient collaboration, a collaboration without a long sense of, of history, of being rooted in a, in a particular neighborhood, a particular place. I think um, we can conclude here. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Abdul Malik. Thank you so much. <laughs>